Since its founding in 1926, the Animal Rescue League of Iowa has continued to expand to serve people and homeless animals across the entire state. Since then, the ARL has become Iowa's largest nonprofit animal shelter and it cares for thousands of pets each year. And today, we're going to take you inside the Animal Rescue League to learn more about the important work they do in serving people and their pets across the state of Iowa. The ARL does this through a variety of services and programs, including cruelty interventions, medical care and clinics, pet adoptions, rehabilitation, foster care, and so much more. Keep watching because after the break, we're headed to the ARL's Rescue Ranch. Our first stop here at the ARL is at the Rescue Ranch, and I've got Josh Colvin here to give us a little bit more info. Hi, Josh. What can you tell me about the space that we're in right now? So this is the Rescue Ranch, and uh, the Animal Rescue League is all about second chances. And so this is a great space for our horses and other types of livestock. Very good. Um, what kinds of animals are currently in the Rescue Ranch? Well, right now we have horses, and we have potbelly pigs, and some chickens. Oh, very good. Uh, what is this beautiful animal's name? Can you tell me a little bit of, more about her? Yeah, uh, Sierra is an interesting story. Um, it's actually one that we helped with in uh, Warren County. And the uh, interesting part about that whole thing is that uh, we had two different locations of people neglecting horses, unfortunately. Oh. Oh. So, you know, so we ended up having to, uh, to go down and we assisted the Sheriff's Department and she was actually pregnant at the time uh, and being neglected at the same time. So she was able to, to have her baby and um, so she, you know, had it here and, and we raised the, the baby up for, uh, for adoption, so. Very good. And is she no longer here? Is the baby no longer here? Uh, right, uh, yep, yep, been adopted and so now we're just waiting for an adoption for mom. Very good. How do most of the animals here arrive at the rescue ranch? Um, so th most of them actually come that have been neglected, been through some really horrendous uh, situations. Um, so we deal with, uh, you know, the, the entire state of Iowa um, where people can actually call and be, you know, call us in, law enforcement can call us in, mm -hmm. and uh, we try to work with law enforcement to, you know, get through those situations and then if we end up having to take those animals, we have this wonderful space uh, to be able to, to house them and, and, and work on them. So this is a barn and it's a pretty big space from what I can see. How many animals can you fit in this area? Well, quite a few. Um, you know, it's, it's got its limitations, obviously. That's where our volunteers come in, which is, is nice. So, you know, if we do have a big case where we end up having a lot of different animals, you know, we rely on volunteers. But this is a good uh, space to work with them. We have a lot of volunteers, good staff to really work on these animals to, um, to get them up for adoption. But it does, sometimes it's a long road to get them there. Right. How does the ARL Cruelty Intervention Program kind of help these animals along? So, so we go through the court system. Um, so our job is to basically, you know, present the case and make the case and help law enforcement have this case so the people may not, may or may not be able to get these animals back, mm -hmm. depending on the circumstances. Um, sometimes we run into situations where people just got over their head, right? Right. So in those cases, we work with them, and it could be just, you know, especially in the livestock, and, you know, that they can't afford the hay, all right? So we're going to be able to help them, you know, maybe get through a really rough winter. To the other extreme where we have animals that, you know, these, these folks should probably not even have animals. Right. And those are the situations that are pretty heartbreaking, and, you know, when we end up having to take those animals and go through the court system, then that's where we kick in and we help the law enforcement make a good case because uh, we are considered the experts in these type of situations. Uh, work with law enforcement to start to finish and then after that, uh, you know, then we can really do a lot of great work for these animals to get them to where they need to be. So what other types of animals are taken care of in the cruelty intervention program? So we've talked a lot about the livestock, but we also deal with uh, domestic animals as well. Uh, give you an example, um, Sandyville this year, mm -hmm. uh, we had to deal with a pretty horrendous situation with dogs. Um, and it was a really bad situation to a point where it really affected a lot of staff here too. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, this was considered a rescue. 
So animals and or dogs were actually coming from a lot of different places to this one location where they really trusted that somebody was going to be taking care of those animals and of course that was not the case. Very good. Well, thank you so much for talking to us about the rescue ranch and everything that it has to offer. When we come back, we're headed in to talk to Tom Colvin about the Animal Rescue League of Iowa's medical suite. Stay with us. We have made our way to the medical suite, and with me now is Tom Colvin to give us a little bit more info. Tom, what can you tell us about the medical suite? Okay, well, Hannah, like you said, we're back in the medical suite. That also is our surgical area. Uh, and it's also, uh, you can see these different stations when you come back into this area that actually a number of procedures happen as well. You know, we can kind of hear, uh, you know, a dental machine going on at the present time because besides all of the spaying and neutering we do, there's a lot of spaying and neutering that happens back here both for all the animals that are going up for adoption, not only dogs and cats, kittens and puppies, but rabbits and uh, ferrets and any okay. number of other animals. In fact, we've actually, you know, spayed or neutered, uh, you know, a pig back here, a <laughs> raccoon back here, you know, and years ago we were actually called upon to alter a tiger, which somebody had as a pet, wrongly, uh. ended up to the Animal Rescue League and then went on to a sanctuary after it had been been altered back here. So, yeah, so lots of activity happens back into this area. Uh, you know, they can do up to about 70, you know, procedures a day. So this is really a hopping area. Now, besides what we do for the internal animals that are being spayed and neutered and, you know, uh, there may be tumors removed, uh, you know, if it's severe, there may even be amputation of limbs that happen back here or eyes that have to be removed. That's primarily because of injuries due to cars and other accidents. Uh, you know, besides that, we do have community days where basically through grants that we receive, uh, the public, primarily residents in Des Moines, uh, can actually have the services of low cost or no cost spaying and neutering done. And all of this, Hannah, we do because there is such still a bed overpopulation problem that we're trying to get ahead of that with all of this spaying and neutering. So when it comes down to it, you kind of turn it into a full service like veterinary clinic, if I'm, you know, the, if that's the correct term in your medical suite, is that correct? Yes, for the animals that are here, you know, it is uh, virtually a, a full service clinic for the ones that are actually signed over to the Animal Rescue League. Very good. Well, I know you have a lot of traffic that comes in and out with your animals and whatnot. Do you have a pretty big staff? We do, have, uh, we do have a staff. We could always use more staff, and I can't impress how valuable volunteers are for us. You know, we basically have over 2,000 volunteers, which makes it so much more possible for us to do all of the things that you hear and are learning today that the Animal Rescue League does. Uh, so staff-wise, we have currently 106 staff. That's for all of our locations, primarily here at the main location but uh, also through our animal control uh, activities and all of those types of things and our satellites as well. 106 total. Uh, most of those are full-time because as you can imagine, taking care of animals is a full-time job, 24-7. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I can see in front, I know some of the stuff that's going on behind me right now. There are some surgeries that are going on. So how does this program contribute to saving lives? You know, we have three full-time uh, veterinarians on staff mm -hmm. and that is just critical to you know saving lives to you know performing all the types of things that we're doing to get them ready for adoption or you know care for them if they come in sick injured uh, or neglected you know all of those types of things really throw together to save lives well, this is just a stop in the animal's journey here. Where do they head after this? So it is, Hannah, uh, just a stop. Uh, certainly they're going to, from here, uh, recover from surgery. Uh, there may be additional vaccinations, some additional medications that we want to give them. But it's important to us from this point that we're going to get them quickly into the adoption area. So that's what's going to take place after they leave here. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for taking the time to talk to me today and tell me all about what's happening here in the medical suite. Thank you, Hannah. 
Next up, we're headed to talk to Stephanie Filer about the Dog and Cat Adoption Center. Stay tuned. We have made it to the Cat and Dog Adoption Center, and with me now is Stephanie Filer to give us a little bit more information. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. What can you tell us about the Cat and Dog Adoption Center? Well, our Adoption Center is certainly a very busy place. We have people from all over the state come to look to adopt a new pet. Very good. Very good. So what kind of animals are available for adoption? Well, we have cats and dogs, of course. Um, then we also have our barn animals, and we have um, small animals like rabbits, guinea pigs, gerbils, hamsters. We have some hermit crabs, <laughs> turtles sometimes. Squirmy kittens. Yeah, I can see that one. <laughs> so what's all included in an adoption fee? Um, adoption fees include spay-neuter surgery, microchip, vaccinations uh, for cats, dogs, and rabbits, and then also 10% off our retail store and 10% off dog training classes for dog adopters. Very good, very good. How do most of your pets arrive here at the ARL? Yeah, we get about half of our pets arrive as a stray. Um, so their, their owners either were unable to find them or uh, did not right. look for them. And then we also have about half of our pets arrive um, as an owner surrender, which means that their owner just no longer could care for them. Um, that could be either that they were moving, uh, could be that they were um, no longer able to afford them. There's a lot of reasons why people are no longer able to care for their pets, and that's where the Animal Rescue League comes in to help. What can people do to kind of help out here at the Animal Rescue League? Yeah, there's a lot of ways people can get involved. Obviously, they can help by adopting. Mm -hmm. um, if their, their home's already full, they can help by fostering temporarily um, to give animals like these guys a break from the shelter if they've been here for a little bit. Um, we also have fosters help with um, animals that are too young or too small for their spay-neuter surgery. They can have them in their home for a few weeks until they're ready for adoption. And we also have people help with fosters of bottle babies that need to be fed every couple hours um, mm -hmm. since they came in with a, a mom and were not uh, yet ready to be living on their own, came, out, came in without a mom. Yeah. Um, but really everything in between. We have a, a lot of need for fostering, of course. And then donation-wise, um, people can help with cat and food litter donations. Mm -hmm. They can help with um, monetary donations, either monthly or one time, and really, a lot of different ways that people can donate and it goes a long way. Right, you touched on it a little bit. What can you tell me about the foster program that you guys have here? Yeah, our foster program um, definitely is one of our biggest needs. We have anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 animals in our care at any given time, but we have really limited space that we can have the animals here. So the foster homes definitely give us a lot more space to help a lot more animals. Well, I know if I was in that position as a foster parent to an animal, I'm going to want to keep them. Do you see that often? Yeah, we see about half of the homes will decide to adopt. <laughs> Once they um, get them in the home, they get used to them, and they, it works really well with the family, then they make the decision that they couldn't live without them and end up adopting, and that's definitely encouraged. Um, and then we also have families who really are just planning to foster. And once their foster animal is adopted, they'll take on another one, and that's encouraged as well. We need all types. Very good. Are there any like special events that kind of go on here that are for like the animals and people that can kind of come here? Yeah. In addition to our adoption center, there's a lot of other ways to meet adoptable pets. We have um, adopted adoption events in the community where people can come out to some of the shopping centers and meet some of our adoptable pets. And then we have um, puppy parties when we have puppies available for adoption where people can come and just get a puppy fix or come and, and adopt a puppy if they're looking. Um, then we also have cat and kitten yoga where uh, <laughs> people can do yoga with a room full of kittens and meet, a, meet one that they might be interested in as well. Very good. I've heard about a program that's called Dogs Day Out. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, our Dogs Day Out program is a really fun program for people who just want a dog fix um, or are looking to adapt. They can come in during our open hours and they can um, borrow a dog for a few hours or even the whole day. Um, take them to a variety of places around town. We have a lot of pet-friendly businesses that we suggest or other community events. And if they're interested in adopting after that, they certainly can. But otherwise, they'll get a chance to meet a lot of other adopters along the way, which is the goal. Awesome. Well, that sounds like a great program to kind of get people out, get them moving, and also get some of these precious animals kind of out of out of here and get some fresh air. Exactly. Thank you so much, Stephanie, Thank you. for taking the time to talk to us about the Adoption Center here. Next up, we're headed to talk with Megan Weedman about the Clowder House. We have arrived at the Clowder House, and I'm joined with Megan Weedman, and she's about to tell us a little bit more information about it. 
Hi, Megan. Hi. What can you tell me about the Clowder House? Well, can you tell me what Clowder means? I cannot. <laughs> it is a noun that just stands for a group or a cluster of cats. Okay. And since this building is all designated for cats, that's how it got named. Very nice. Um, downstairs is um, 158 cages that are very big cages for these cats to have ample room to live in. And then it has a separate bathroom area for their litter box as well. There are um, levels on each side, so they have some kind of variance in their height abilities when they're living in these cages. And then up here on the top floor, we have these apartment style cages just to give them a, even more room um, to kind of adjust to shelter life. Very good. So um, what are the benefits of the new condo design that are here? Sure. The new condo design downstairs especially, like I said, it has the more ample room. That right. helps reduce stress, which helps then reduce um, if they would happen to get sick, that kind of thing. It just kind of makes them feel more comfortable as they um, are in our care with us until we can get them into their forever homes. Okay. And then up here, these apartments are even more room for them. Um, and these guys up here are certain behavior cats that we're working with whether that is overstimulation and play biting, such as Quill here. Um, we work on those behaviors with some volunteers that have been specifically trained with the cat team to work on these behavior cats. Okay. Um, there's also some kitties up here that were fearful when they came in, meaning they didn't necessarily want to be held or petted. So we put them up here, they have more room, they have some hidey boxes so they can kind of hide and hang out, but then our volunteers will go in there and interact with them and get them more comfortable and used to interacting with humans so then we can place them for adoption. All right, so what do your staff do in order to kind of help with those behaviors up here? Sure, so like I said, they're, the volunteers and the staff are trained to work with these behaviors. Mm -hmm. If they're playing with a guy like Quill that starts to maybe play bite, we'll throw a treat or a, a toy so they can kind of redirect and go to that object instead of our hands because um, nobody wants a kitty that's going to bite them or right. anything. As far as the fearful cats, they'll just go in and maybe read to them just so they get used to the human voice. They'll throw treats out to kind of gain their trust. Okay. And as the animal gets closer and keeps gaining trust, then they can start petting with them. And even just the everyday interactions of feeding and cleaning them, that helps gain trust in everything as well. Right. I noticed you have some TVs up here as well. Or do those we help do. with some stimulation? They do. So we can add some visual stimulation for them, you know, just change up their everyday um, living quarters. We also have some Bluetooth radio, so we can play audio books, we can play some music, um, and we try to switch out their toys and their treats almost daily so that they don't get bored. Okay, so about how many cats does the ARL take care of each day? Sure, that's a good question. Um, most shelters average around 70% cat population. Mm -hmm. We are definitely on that average, if not a little higher. <laughs> we do average anywhere from 800 to 1,100 cats on a daily basis. Wow. Um, that kind of goes up and down, just kind of depending on our season. There is what's known as kitten season around town, um, and that's usually in the spring, and actually it's hitting again in the fall as okay. well. And so we will see spikes in our intakes um, because of that coming in. And so then we try to get these kitties that are coming in, moms with litters, out to foster. So we have a big foster base as well, and send out anywhere from two to 300 cats throughout the year to get fostered before they're ready for adoption. Yeah. What are some of the other steps that the ARL takes in order to make sure that cats, cats are happy and comfortable? And sure. Well, this building is very highly state-of-the-art, especially okay. with the HVAC design. Um, there are UV lights in our air system, and UV light can actually kill disease. Okay. And that helps, you know, to prevent the upper respiratory that can be prevalent in shelters. Right. Um, so that helps reduce their stress so they don't get sick. Um, and it just has a continual airflow that can, um, it brings in the outside air, heats it or warms it, depending on the season, and then pushes it back out. And that happens multiple times throughout the day. So the fresher the air, the better for them. All right, so say someone at home is having some issues with their cat via behavioral issues, where might they go to find out some more information on that? Sure, they can definitely visit our website. It's arl-iowa.org forward slash cats. There's okay. a lot of information on that website for behavioral um, tips and tricks that they can certainly access. Oh, very cool. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for taking time to talk to us today about the Clowder House and everything that it has to offer. Great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today on our mission to learn about the Animal Rescue League of Iowa. The ARL doesn't receive any state, federal, or United Way funding. It relies on numerous grants, support and donations from businesses, organizations, and individuals just like you. Even if you're unable to offer a donation, there are so many other ways you can help. For more information about the ARL or to learn more about volunteer opportunities and the many other ways you can get involved, visit their website arl-iowa.org.